do at their companies. Amanda, why don't we get started with you? Sounds good. Thanks, Maribel. Um, my name is Amanda Halo. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Sixth Sense. We are a big data predictive intelligence solution for B2B marketing and sales. Uh, the end of the store, basically our key value proposition is we're not just scoring your existing and your known leads, but we're really helping you find opportunities to optimize across the entire sales and marketing funnel. Wonderful. Good morning. How's everybody? <laughs> cool. I see you're all on your laptops working hard. <laughs> we'll talk about that actually a little bit uh, about what the role of marketing is here. I'm Scott Brumfield. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Exactly Corporation. Uh, we like to say that we inspire performance by ensuring that the workforce becomes engaged and the way that you get engaged is to make sure that everything that happens in the company, all the alignment of the employee activities to the goals and the way we do that is through incentives. And we have paid out over $10 billion of incentive payments in the last two years. We've implemented 16,000 plans across the world and with that, because we are a multi-tenant SaaS company, we have all the data about what plans work and what plans don't work. So one of our key products is a product called Insights, where you go in and you say, here's how we're doing it. How are we compared to my industry peer group, to benchmarks so that you can get to best in class and actually get the result that you want, which is to get everybody doing the right thing at the right time. Yeah. Now, Scott, let's start with you. The role of the CMO has changed dramatically in the past five years as a result of technology. And we really talk about CMOs really being a digital people at this point really focusing on that. Can you tell me how the role has changed in your opinion? So a show of hands, how many think the role's changed fundamentally in the last five years? So that's interesting, that's only about, I, it's hard to see, there's only about a third of the group. Uh, so I'm gonna speak not to that third, I'm gonna speak to the other two thirds that don't think it's changed. Uh, it's fundamentally changed. Uh, I've heard some statistics uh, around the conference, uh, some statistics that uh, Amanda and I have both seen about 67% of the purchase decision is now made before a salesperson ever gets on the phone. So the very first thing that has happened is the role of marketing is fundamentally different from creating top of funnel and expecting people to kind of push themselves naturally through it. The role now extends all the way to the point, I use this analogy in my company all the time, my job fundamentally is to create sales qualified pipeline. So if I'm holding that baton of that prospect, the salesperson has to grab it from me and says this is an actual qualified lead. So it's no longer about just creating top of funnel, it's about making sure that you do top of funnel, mid funnel, and bottom of the funnel so that you get the highest quality lead flow. That's the first thing that's changed. Which means, by the way, that there's tight alignment between marketing and sales, better than ever before. <clears throat> if you don't have alignment with your sales organizations, there's something fundamentally wrong. The second thing is with technology, it is all become, uh, becoming data driven. We have more information at our fingertips than we ever had before. We'll talk a little bit about the, the particulars here, but I want to extend it out to what I call predictive intelligence, which I think is the next big wave. And then the third thing that's fundamentally changed is you no longer have to be experts at the creativity because, be, because of the technology, you have the ability to A-B test everything you do, split test everything that you do, keep trying and experimenting and trying and experimenting and let the data tell you which way to go. So you need to keep that creativity in your organization, probably more so than ever before because you're iterating all the time, and then you have to be really analytic, and therefore you have to kind of have both the left brain and the right brain in order to make it work effectively. Now you've actually really captured uh, the concept of really using the data, and I know we've talked to Mark about using data for a long time, and now we have more data. How did you two find each other? Because you deal a lot with data, and I'm sure there are a lot of choices, and I know you've been very actively pursuing different solutions, almost ahead of the problem in, in some way. Linda, how'd you find it? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll just give a quick little backstory on how we got started. So we were five years building our product based on a real customer need. So we were a, service, a big data services company for 14 years. Um, Cisco was a customer for 10 years. We had an idea five years ago that we had their sales data, we had marketing automation data, we had a ton of third party data, bringing this together and how can we use this data to drive their business forward and look at patterns of behavior of customers that have purchased to find new customers. So when we started, when we had that aha moment at Cisco where I'll never forget the day that I delivered the results to a few VPs that were sitting around a table and one of them stood up and said, Amanda, do you know what you're doing? And I said, yeah, I'm predicting your sales. And she said, no, you're not predicting our sales. You're actually, you know our customers are gonna buy before they even know they're gonna buy. And the conversation went to, let's send them POs before they're even there. And that got us really excited. And I knew that we had something. I knew we were onto something. 
So then I went out and sought venture funding and said, this is no longer a services company. We need to do something more to build a product company. And in that process um, is how I met Scott. It was when I was early, before we were even funded, one of the VCs who we were looking at um, a term sheet from connected us together. And I think he, she was betting whether or not, you know, whether our technology with Scott as a CMO, a potential buyer. And I was incredibly excited to work with Scott for, for one major reason, is that his company is a growth stage company. We have proven it with nine other big B2B enterprise companies that have tons of data. They were creating a new market, creating a space. Could we use predictive intelligence for that type of company as well? So uh, just following on that, so then I'll sort of take the baton. So Amanda made a fairly bold claim that she could predict my sales. Uh, that sounded pretty exciting to me. Uh, I tend to be pretty innovative on the software uh, you know, line. I will go to beta test almost anything if it sounds interesting. So what we did, one of the things that we did was we took all of our, the, the people that were known to us already in, in our database, and we ran the model through, uh, through the 6SI thing to determine where behaviorally were the people. Were they just interested? Were they considering? Were they in a decision mode? Or were they in a purchase mode? And it's, I'll let Amanda talk about the particulars here. And what we did is we correlated what Amanda's technology or software said, what they thought was in purchase mode, compared it to what we thought was in a sales cycle. And I just want to get a couple of shout outs. What percentage correlation do you think we get? 25? 10% correlation? 25%? Any hands at 50%? No hands. One hand. One hand. 74%. We, we, because I, I used to be the chief financial officer of, of exactly a few years back, and they moved me into this new role. I don't know if that was a promotion or a demotion, I'm not sure which way that goes, but, but I kind of need to get it, sort of prove it to me sort of thing, and when I saw that, I fell out of my chair. I, I, I said, man, we know those are, are, are in purchase cycle, and the system said that they should be in purchase cycle. So think about what happens predictively if I can go out to a place where people have never logged on to my uh, website, have never downloaded anything, and 6SI can come back in and say, we think these companies are in a purchase cycle. That is really huge. And I think the big thing with that too, is, and the reason we're able to do that, is all a matter, it's actually really simple. So if you think about the world we live in, we live in this complex world of data. We are all, you guys are all on your computers, on your laptops, on your screens, right? You're leaving behind this digital footprint of exactly what you want and what you need before you raise your hand, before you download that white paper and tell exactly I'm interested in sales compensation software. You have a need because you're hiring sales reps. You're growing your sales team. There are things that are happening that we can pick up on that behavior of those companies and we can be, pick up on those signals to say this company has a need for your products now before that person even knows that they have a need. We all know the serious decisions and all the other um, uh, agencies and things are talking about how 60 to 90% of buyers are making their purchase decision before they get into your sales cycle. And the true value for predictive intelligence is going so much further than just taking those leads and prioritizing them and creating a score. It's helping you find those buyers that really need your products now. They have an intent to buy now. And the way to do that, and so the, really the key difference is really the behavioral intent data. So I'm not going to focus a lot about you know, how what our differences are to others, but it's all these attributes about a company and attributes about a contact that you can either scrape the web for or buy. We all do that, but where the value is, is looking for behaviors, that people are leaving behind these signals in these digital channels to tell you that they have a need to buy your product. And that's what we're kind of keying in on to make those predictions. And I'll correct Scott that we're six cents, not six SI anymore, but <laughs> Scott's been with us for so long. <laughs> so Scott, you are actually looking for technologies and solutions to, as a CMO. What types of products and solutions did you think were going to help you scale and grow? Uh, well, you know, the classic marketing automation tools, we all use them now. Uh, that industry didn't even exist seven years ago, and now it's one of the hottest industries in the space. I saw a recent infographic, yeah, I just was stunned by it, that there were over 300 logos on this slide that says, here are all the people that are sort of playing in that space. Uh, doing the traditional marketing automation is cool and linking that up with CRM is cool. But the piece that, that I really feel strongly about is the pull through. I said earlier that if 67% of people are actually making the decision or, or learning about your space before the salesperson ever gets involved, I want to know what they're doing and I want to figure out how can I help pull them through the funnel. And so I'm looking for technologies to clean my database, I'm looking for technologies that can A-B test. 
I'm looking for ways that I can learn more about how to move in a more agile way. Because if I can actually increase my conversion rates and increase my close rates, my cost of acquisition gets really low. And then everybody probably here in the room is familiar with the magic number, which is give me all of your marketing and all of your sales and compare that to what I'm doing in the following year relative to your bookings. And if my magic number is over one, I know I have a scaling environment. Well, if I had to spend all my money in, top of to in, in terms of tofu, and I can't get the pull through, my cost of acquisition is going to go through the roof. So what I was specifically looking for when Amanda came to me was, were two things. The first was, I want to know of my known people, where does, uh, where does Sixth Sense think the purchase decision is so I can focus my salespeople on the highest quality lead flow. And then the second piece that I was looking for, which is really the holy grail, is people that I don't know that are interested in purchasing. And I can target them through third-party ad campaigns, content networks, email nurture campaigns, et cetera, on LinkedIn, for example. The other thing that's key here is if, if that is really true and I get that high correlation, let's say there's probably about 50, 70 people in this room, and let's say only 7, 10% of you are interested in what I have to sell. It is way better for me to be able to laser on your interest and not barrage the other people in the room with trying to learn about me. It is better for me to be, to arrive to you at the right place at the right time in the right way and message you that way. And that is a huge move forward in terms of what's happening in marketing. And I think, opinion. yeah, it's about predictive intelligence in this whole space. You know, a lot of people are talking about predictive lead scoring. If you think about the sales and marketing funnel, you have the unknown, which is what Scott was saying, all the way through to the known in marketing, they become a marketing qualified lead, through to sales. Predictive intelligence shouldn't just be when they get into your systems, right? It should be how can we influence everything we're doing from a marketing perspective. At the top of funnel, helping you engage those unknown before they come in, that can influence your media buys and your content syndication strategies, that can influence your marketing automation, all the way through to sales. So it's not just at the bottom of the funnel and helping you prioritize what's in there. I think we really have to think a little bit broader and think about those opportunities before you've actually reached them and use the data that's out there today um, to do that. I think that's great because this whole notion of predictive intelligence, I think, is changing. We've talked about it before. It seems it's very popular now with all the data that we have and, and moving forward. So having a broader view of it, I think, is really important. Scott, what types of metrics or outcomes do you expect to receive as a result of putting in this new technology? Uh, I expect to see metrics where my conversion rates from leads to opt-ins to sales accepted to sales qualified improve all the way through. I, accept to, I expect to see an improvement in the sales cycle. If I know that somebody actually has an intent to purchase, that shouldn't be if, if it's an enterprise. Uh, for example, we sell uh, emerging markets, we sell mid-markets, we sell enterprise. An average sales cycle for us in the enterprise is maybe 15 months. Mm -hmm. If I know that somebody is out there really interested, I could pull that in a significant amount because I'm targeting them at the right time. And then the, the penultimate, or the ultimate, would be uh, close rates. I can, I can get my close rates way, way up so that the performance uh, productivity levels of the sales teams are would be you know, best in class. Yeah. I love this concept that we talked about earlier, too, of being able to target the right message to the right people at the right time instead of the barrage of information. Because I think that's one of the really interesting things. If you know where somebody is in the funnel, you can actually give them the right information. We were actually talking a little bit about this before uh, hand. I was thinking about not using the analogy, but I'm actually going to use the analogy of dating. So when you go out on the first date, you don't try to barrage that date with everything about you. And at the end of that date, ask whether they want to get married to you. That's and what I've been doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what happens, that's traditionally what we do. It's a certain, as soon as somebody raises their hand just a little bit, we just fire hose them with all this data. And, all this, and we just barrage them, and they, then they opt out. And it is way better if you can just recognize that people are at a different stage in the process and treat them differently and treat them respectfully as you go through the process. Yeah. Third question in the audience. We have somebody to, on Lake Runner to take questions if anybody has one. Let's see. There's gotta be some questions, folks. This is kind of cutting edge. So when you say we like go and find that correlation, who is we? Like what does that team look like? Um, so yeah, we have a, <clears throat> So our, at Sixth Sense, we are upward of 20-something employees. We're mostly data scientists, so we have seven PhDs on staff and engineers. Um, but when I say when we, how we do it is really about the data. So there are really two camps of data, and most companies are talking about all this static, descriptive data about companies, the attributes about the company, about the contact. 
but it's the B2B buyer intent behavioral data that's actually incredibly predictive. So what's happening on Scott's website and what's happening on thousands of B2B publisher sites, blogs, communities, forums, that activity is what drives the machine learning and the modeling to make the predictions. So it's not just saying that the right job role, job function, size of company. We're actually saying these companies are showing that behavior and then the machine learning makes that prediction. By the way, that's the area that I think where Amanda has something that's unique, which is a lot of companies are doing what I call firmographic. So I'm mapping the, the, the information about the company, but I, and so I know it's the right fit for that company, but I don't know if that company's in, interested. And when you map the behavioral over the top of firmographic, that's when you get the interesting, uh, the interesting uh, activity. Okay, you start with saying, are they the right buyer profile? And everybody needs to do that. And that's what that school lead scoring really is doing. It's creating that ideal buyer profile. Do they fit your profile of company and contact and lead? And then do we say, are they in market to buy now? And that's what's missing from those other technologies is they say, yes, they're the right profile. But for me, for example, I was buying a CRM solution about six months ago. I was trying to decide between Relayed IQ, Salesforce, whatever it was. I met the right buyer profile. Six months before that, I was launching our company. Six months from now, I'm on to something else. There's no way that I'm listening to and, and hearing the message about a CRM solution. So you have to find that buyer when they're ready to buy now. Another question from the audience? There's one in the back. Hi, this is a question for Six Sense. I'm just curious if you could share with us what the minimum threshold of data that you need in order to make those predictions. Like how many accounts, yep. what historical kind of data do you need? Yeah, so we, we start with just taking in your web data and your CRM data. So you would need to have some kind of CRM. You have to have some kind of conversion points and say a thousand or so uh, known accounts that have converted. Um, but then from there, we're relying on a lot of other data on top. We would eventually love to take in your call center data and your bookings data and everything else, and we layer that in to get smarter and smarter. So we're not just predicting this company and this person's gonna buy, but we say how much they're gonna buy, when they're gonna buy, what channel, what message to read them with. So there's so much more that you can do as we layer in those other systems. But just coming back with the data itself, so just to say this company is highly likely to buy is a great starting point that's game changing. Um, so you only need you know, a thousand or so conversions, but. You do have to have, they have to be a considered purchase. It's not something that an impulse buy is not something we're ever gonna play in. So for Caterpillar, when somebody gets a flat tire, I'm not gonna help them predict that company needs a new tire. But I will help them predict that company needs a new excavator. Perfect. And with that, I think we have to close, but uh, will you be around for the break? Yes, I will. Will you be around for the break? Yes. Wonderful, so please come see us during the break. Thank you. Thank you.